So we, in the last session, we talked about uh, how to live in God's grace and be motivated by God's grace to obey God's law. And um, so the, po the point is that we don't, uh, we're not pressured to obey God, but God is so gracious. We look at God's grace and blessings, we are motivated by His grace and blessings that we want to follow Him. Uh, and uh, that's true in the Bible, that the Bible says that, that, that we're compelled by God's love, that, uh, that He has died for all, and that we are willing to die for Him, that because we love because God first loved us. So the Bible has a lot of teachings about the motivation coming from God's grace and blessings. And now we talk about how to motivate people to change. So how do we apply that to our teaching? How do we uh, encourage people to obey God? Um, first point here is turn people's eyes to God's grace. That um, uh, there are a lot of teachings that they just tell people, okay, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you need to repent and obey. That is just turning the people's eyes to their sins and to what they should do. And we want to turn people's eyes to God's grace. God is so gracious. He has saved us. He has given us deliverance. He forgives us. He loves us. He loves us so much. He is willing to. Jesus was willing to die for us, and and He worked in our life in so many ways. So we thank God for His wonderful blessings. So we turn people's eyes in every passage in the Bible. Uh, now there are many passages that doesn't talk about God's grace right away, but we can find the. Uh, underlying grace. Uh, for instance, the Bible says, do not give the devil a foothold. So this verse tells us what to do. But the background is that God has victory over Satan. And he has given us all kinds of blessings. And then if we give the devil a foothold, we let Satan steal from us. So the grace underlying that is that Jesus has victory over all power of Satan that we have he has given us authority to trample on the snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing can harm us so that is the background and then but when we sin we give the devil a foothold but sometimes people just talk about what we should what we should do in order to prevent giving the devil a foothold but we should turn to look at God's grace he is so He's victorious. He has defeated Satan totally. So we don't have to fear at all. We don't have to worry at all. When we look at God's grace, there is more motivation and also people have more confidence to be changed. And we notice that uh, there are many places that talk about God's grace giving us motivation. For instance, Jesus said, don't worry because God takes care of even the sparrow. So he can he wants to take care of the sparrow that none of them none of the sparrows will fall to the ground without the permission of God so we too we are much more precious than many sparrows so Jesus used the grace of God in how he loves the sparrows and love people to motivate us not to worry uh, not to uh, worry about our food and clothing and uh, he also tell us to have confidence to pray because God already knows our needs before we pray. So He knows our needs already. So that gives us the motivation. He knows our needs and He cares about us so we can pray with confidence. So always turn people's eyes to God's grace. This is something we need to learn. We need to learn to look at God's grace from many Bible passages to look at the underlying God's grace and to look at what God must have done in order to give us that grace. And then the first motivation should come from God's grace. God's law gives instruction and warning. So God's law tells us what to do and warning. Okay, so how to discover God's grace from any Bible passage? So how do we discover? First, look at God's nature when He can do, when He can do what He promised the passage. So when he can do something, when he, when Jesus said to the woman, "Take heart, be of good cheer, uh, daughter, 
So what nature does he have? The nature is a nature of acceptance, a nature of having a fatherly heart, a nature of caring about her feeling. So when in each passage we can look for God's nature, and what is God's heart for us? What is His heart, His, His intention for us? What does He care about? And three, what grace, help, and blessings does He give to us? So what grace, what, what are the blessings that He gives us? He gives us acceptance, He gives us the Holy Spirit, He gives us the forgiveness, and He gives us uh, uh, the, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit to help us to change. So, in each passage, what did he do to help us? And for what actions does he have to do in order to give us that grace? In order for the Holy Spirit to be able to change us all the time when we sin, what does the Holy Spirit have to do all the time? The Holy Spirit has to be with us all the time. So whenever the Holy Spirit senses that we have sins, then he motivates us to repent. And the Holy Spirit continues to to uh, send His guidance to us. So He continues to have a plan connected to God the Father. God the Father has a plan in our life and, and the Holy Spirit is connected to God and give us that guidance from God. So all this action He has to do, instead of just talking about, oh, when the Holy Spirit guides you, listen to Him and obey Him. Instead, we can first look at what the Holy Spirit must have done first. So He cares about us all the time. He senses what is happening in us. And He wants us to follow God's perfect plan because the perfect plan is the best for us. And He moves us to follow God's perfect plan. Even when we disobey Him, He continues to touch our heart. He continues to guide our heart. So that's His action. His action. He takes different steps to achieve that, that uh, uh, action. And then number five, what should we do to receive that grace? So when the Holy Spirit moves in us, what should we do? We should respond to the Holy Spirit and appreciate God. Thank you, Lord, for moving in my heart to guide me. That's wonderful. And then you guide me out of my sins and follow you. Okay, now here, the first point here, to motivate people to love God. How do we motivate people to love God? 1 John, John 4.19 We love because He first loved us. So this verse tells us that we love because He first loved us. So how can we motivate people to love, love God? God is love. Everyone born of Him has experienced love and inherit the nature of love. Christians, according to a new nature, will naturally love God and people. So God, has, God is love and his, uh, whoever is born of God God put His love into the heart of people. So when we are born again, we inherit this nature of love from God first. And then the more we stay in God's love, the more we will love. So when we have this love, the more He stays in our heart, the more we have a good relationship with Him, the more He will motivate us to change. So first, this motivation came from God's nature and He's working in our heart. So motivate people to love God, 1 Corinthians 2.9 But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. So God is love. He treasures people who love Him. He will use His creativity to create things people cannot imagine and give to those who love Him. So when we love Him, he, he will use his creativity. He will prepare for things we never see, never hear, and never think of. So he, uh, when he sees someone loves us, he is very happy. And then he has creativity. He has creativity to create a brain, to create different kinds of birds and animals, to create different kinds of hormones in our body. Everything God created is wonderful. It has great creativity. So God when he sees someone has having love for him, God treasures that. God appreciates that, and then he would change. Uh, he would has a wonderful plan for this person. He will prepare. So that gives us motivation to want to love God. And First Corinthians thirteen thirteen, the greatest of this is love. So um, 
that when we have love, that uh, then when we have love, this is this is the greatest. This is the greatest of all. Faith, hope, love, and the greatest is love. That when we have love, is the greatest. It's it's uh, that we will manifest the love of God. So uh, when you have love for people, it will show God's love in your life. And continue. Uh, so John 21, 15, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than this? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. So God's kingdom is a kingdom of love. God's message is a message of love. God wants us to use people who love him to serve him. So Jesus asked Peter, Do you love me? three times to let him examine his heart does he really love Jesus and the kingdom of God is a kingdom of love so anyone who serves in the kingdom of God we want to show we want to have the love of God that we really love people we really love God before we love people we have a then when we love God and then God can work in our life and then we can love people and then too God's love renews our lives and gives us a life of love and message, messages of love. So God's love, He renews our lives when we have God's love. When we, when we love God first, then we have a good relationship with Him. Then when He stays in our heart, He will change our lives. He will change our life and give us a life of love and messages of love. That our life will be full of love and our messages, what we say, will be full of love. 1 John 5 1 Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves his child also as well. So everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So uh, when we believe in Jesus, we are born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. So everyone who loves the Father, God the Father, will also love the children of God. So when we have the life of God, when we are born of God, then we want to love God's children also. So he is, who is born of God believes that Jesus is the Christ. That uh, He believes that Jesus is the, the Christ, the Savior, and then he is born of God. The most important quality of people born of God is that they will love the Father and God's children. So they will love God and, and God's children. God is love. The relationship with Him will, will bring love. So what I mean is in all these passages, we want to look at God's nature, God's love to motivate people. We want to manifest the love of God. God is full of love when we live in Him. We are full of love and then we can love people. And then God is very happy when we love people. And uh, He will prepare for us things we never imagined. So it will bless ourselves and will bless people. Okay, now, so the previous passages, let me look at this again. So we love because He first loves us. So how do we motivate people? God loves us first. He loves us so much. He cares about us. So when we are blessed by God, can we love people? And then, uh, if we love God, God will prepare for us things we never imagined. So when you love God, when you have a heart to love God and love people, God will prepare for you things that is so wonderful. So are you willing to love God more and let God's love change your life. And then uh, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of love. Before we serve God, we want to be filled with the love of God. That we love Jesus Christ first. We love God first before we love people. And then when we love God, then our nature will be changed. And then we are full of the love of God. And then uh, when we are born of God, that means the Holy Spirit gives us a new life. And the Holy Spirit will bring us the new nature of love. When we have this nature of love, it shows that we are children of God. And we let this love grow stronger and stronger. We want to have a stronger love of God and for people. And then, and then our life will blossom and go stronger and stronger and bless more people. Now, those were using the grace of God, the love of God, to motivate people to love God. Now, here is the commandment. The commandment to remind people to love God. Mark 12, 29. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments 
is here, O Israel, the Lord your uh, God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So the Bible tells us the greatest of all commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your hearts, all your hearts, with all your inner being. All your soul means your spirit and your soul, that uh, the, the inner being, that uh, the, the mind, the, the will, and the feelings, and our soul, and with all our, all our mind and all our strength. So we want to love God with the whole person. The first commandment is to love God, and God loves us first because, and blesses us. Why? And we should love Him also. So this is using a commandment. And then here is a warning. Now for each commandment, there is also a warning. Now this should not be the main motivation of Christians. This should be like a reminder. 1 Corinthians 16.22 If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. So this verse tells us that if anyone doesn't love Jesus, he's accursed. If he doesn't love Jesus, that means he doesn't have the life of Jesus. We are saved by grace through faith, not saved by loving God. But when we are saved by God's grace, then we'll have the new nature of loving God and loving people. And if people don't have that love, that means there is something wrong with the spiritual life. Then his faith is dead. Faith without work is, is dead. So any born-again Christian will have this nature of love. If he doesn't have this nature of love, then he, uh, there's something wrong with his spiritual life and he can face damnation. He can face hell if he doesn't have this new, uh, uh, new life from God. So born-again Christian, God is love. Born-again Christian will love. If a person does not love, there is a problem with his spiritual life. And if he's not born again and has no love, he'll be cursed. So if he's born, not born again and has no love, because of our sinful nature, Christians sometimes lack love. If a Christian continue to have no love, he can lose salvation. If he has no love at all, that he could lose his salvation. So we want to repent of our lack of love and ask God to, to forgive us. Okay, so just now we use different ways to motivate people to love God. Because God is love and God has blessed you in so many ways. So we should love Him. And then when you love Him, God is very happy and He will prepare for you things you never imagined. And uh, uh, love is the nature of God. When you love God, His nature stays in you stronger. And then you will manifest the love of God. And then people will be attracted by you and then come to follow God. So this second part here is motivate people to pray. Matthew 6, 8, Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. So before you pray, God already knows our needs. So first here, God knows our needs. Second, God cares about the sparrows. He will care about me much more. We don't have to keep telling God about our needs. When we love and obey God, He will give the best for us. So when we love God, He will be prepared for those who love Him, things we never imagined. He will prepare for us the best, uh, best for us. So we don't have to worry about God giving us uh, things that are not the best. So when we pray, we we don't have to, you know, we don't have to fear and worry. Now we can ask for what we we want. For instance, we say, "Please give me health." But when we pray for health, we don't have to keep telling God. We don't have to keep telling God, "God, please give me health. Please give me." Uh, uh, take away the sickness. We don't have to keep telling God. We tell God once He already knows. But rather we can spend more time loving God and saying, God, You know my needs. You know my condition. You care about me. You want to heal me. Lord, I thank You, Lord. Thank You for being so wonderful and You love me. You care about me. So when we pray, we have confidence that He will answer our prayer. So we we build up the relationship when we pray. It's not just asking for what we want. Now we can ask for what we want, but then we don't have to keep telling God. <clears throat> Motivate people to change. To pray. Motivate people to pray. 
7, 9, 3, 17. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. So here it talks about God rejoicing over us. God loves us and enjoy the relationship with us. He, he loves us. He loves the relationship. He loves us to pray. So in our prayer, it is more important to trust in His love and to love Him. So in our prayer, it is more, more important to build up the relationship, to love God and to enjoy His love. Then the relationship is stronger. So when we build up a relationship with God, He will give us the best. So if He is a God who delights in us, we want to delight in God. The Bible tells us to also de delight in the Lord. When we delight in the Lord, God is very happy and God will bless us, give us what we need. So in the prayer, it's more important to trust in God's love, to live in God's love, to enjoy God's love, to be strengthened by God's love. Then uh, God sees our love. He will prepare for us things that we never imagined. And then Matthew 6.33, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So to seek God's kingdom means we help more people to be born again. And let Him rule over us. When God, where God rules is His kingdom. So to seek His righteousness means to obey Him. And then when we seek His kingdom and righteousness, He will give us all the things we need to enter His will. And so... We don't have to keep telling God, please give me this, give me that. But when we seek God's kingdom and His righteousness, when we want more people saved, when we uh, let God be our king, and then follow uh, His commandment to seek His righteousness, and then He will give us all these things. Now I noticed that in my life, there are many things I did not ask for, and God gave those to me. So we don't have to remind God all the time and actually a lot of times before we ask He already prepares when we love Him. So it's more important to seek His kingdom and His righteousness and to seek His presence to love Him. And for many people have problems because they don't seek God's kingdom and righteousness. Why do many Christians suffer? They have problematic marriage, problematic spiritual life and problematic ministry because they don't seek God's kingdom and righteousness, because their life is full of problems. So they don't, they have uh, all kinds of problems. But when we seek God, the whole life will be blessed by God. Now I have even seen ministers who, who is not joyful, who is under pressure, the ministry doesn't go well, the family is breaking apart, because they don't let God's love take over his life, their life. They don't let God's love take over their life. Their life is full of pressure, a lot of command, commanding people to do, yelling at people, uh, criticizing people. That is not God's way. God's way, you know, we look at Jesus' life. He doesn't criticize the people around Him. He gives them hope. He gives them motivation. He cares about them. Now, He did point out the sins of the Pharisees. Because these Pharisees don't repent. But when Nicodemus, the Pharisee, came to him, he ex Jesus accepted him very well. So it's the people who don't repent, he warned them. He gave warning to them. But when his followers, even when they are weak, he says, even when you have faith like a little mustard seed, you can move the mountain. So he, he's giving people hope. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, eye has, uh, has not seen and ear has not heard. So we have look at this passage. So when we sincerely love God, He will prepare for us things we cannot imagine, that we can never think of, that He will prepare for us. So in our prayers, it's more important to love God than to ask for blessings. This gives us motivation to spend more time loving Him in our prayer. So in our prayer, we should spend more time loving God. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We adore you. We like you. We want you. When you love God like that, He will open the way for you. Uh, he will bless your life and He will open the way for you to bless more people. And I thank God that He has given me this life. And God has provided for me that I can go to bless different people of different countries to train them and gives me different teachings. So I hope that you see that God is a God of blessings. God is a God of generosity. He's, he's willing, He is more than willing to bless us with all different blessings. If we just 
trust in Him and have a good relationship with Him and delight in Him, He is very happy to prepare for us things never we never imagined. So we ho I hope that we all have this confidence in God. And then whenever we talk about God, we're always happy. We always tell the good things about God. We always tell people, God is wonderful and God will bless you when you follow Him. Okay, John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So the Father draws people to Jesus. It is God who takes the initiative to attract us to Him. So we don't have to worry that God doesn't accept us. So it's the Father who draws people to Jesus. It's the Father draws us to God, draws us to Jesus. So we don't have to worry that God doesn't want us. God really wants us no matter how weak we are no matter how rebellious we are when we repent of our sins God is very happy and it's God who attract us not to be rebellious to come to him to trust in him even when we sin or are lazy to pray he still tries to attract us back to him so he always try to attract us back to him so we can be confident that it is not hard to come close to God and it's not hard for God to bless us. So we have this confidence that it's not hard to come to God. Now I have seen people pray for revival. They say, Oh Lord, give, Lord, give us revival. Revive us, revive us. Give us power of the Holy Spirit. Give us power of miracles. Uh, sometimes I, I sense that they pray in a way that as if God is not willing. They're trying to bend God's hand, uh, bend His heart to say, God, help me, help me, give us revival. Actually, God is willing to give us revival anytime. When we trust in God, God, you're loving, you care about us, you want to revive our spiritual life, and I trust in you, I love you, I care about you. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus, you're so wonderful. When we have this loving relationship with God, God is already reviving our life. And God will change our heart so that we care about God's kingdom. And God will give us love to change people, give us joy to change people, give us ability to enjoy God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We enjoy you. We enjoy you. We like you. We appreciate you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So, when we have this close relationship with God, God will change us, God will bless us, and then so prayer is more important to be changed by God. That God is willing, more than willing to bring revival. When we just have a close relationship, He will bring it to us. So we don't have to, to really twist God in order to get what we want. God wants to give to us. We just say, Lord, I know that you want to give it to us. I just trust in you. So I hope that we we'll pray will be uh, will be uh, different. We're just trusting God. I've seen people also crying a lot in prayer. Now, it's not wrong, but people cry, Oh, Lord, give us revival. Oh, we need revival. Oh, they, they cry, they cry. They say, God is not willing. Uh, actually, anytime we love God, we say, God, you're so wonderful. We are already changed by God. That revival has already come when we trust in God's love. God is already changing us. James 4 8, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. So this and a motivation to, uh, so this, I'm using different Bible passages and different concepts in the Bible to motivate people to pray. John 6 4, 4, 40, 4 tells us that God tries to attract us to Him when we respond and come close to God, He will come close to us. So it's first God draw us to Him and then when we come to Him, He will come close to us. Where God is, He will bring blessings and raise us to a higher level. When we think of praying, we should think of building up a loving relationship with God and this will help us to enter God's plan. So it's most important to build up that relationship with God when we pray, instead of just asking for what we want. Okay, the, the topic we had was motivation people to change by God's grace. And then I went through different things. Motivate people to love God and motivate people to, to pray. Okay, and then motivate people to pray. Another passage, John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. So when we have a close relationship with God and when we ask what we desire, it will be done for me. So God 
cares about whether we stay in Him. First, we stay in God, have a close relationship with Him. When we have a close relationship with God and let His Word stay in us and guide us, God will answer our prayers. When a person follows God's Word, his prayers are not just about his needs, but about relationship with God and His kingdom. So when people have God's Word, He cares about God's kingdom. He wants to follow God's will. He wants God's will done. And then what he prays will come true. So I hope that we see that when we care about God's kingdom, that all these things will be given to us. He will give us, provide us our needs. He will give us health and strength. He will help us in everything we do. So um, it's more important to have a close relationship with him and let the word of God abide in us and follow him. And then when we pray, then great things will come true. So I thank God that he has changed my life that I have been attracted by God's Word since I believe in Jesus and I always love to read the Bible and and obey the Bible and make it uh, to apply the Bible and I found that the more I apply it the more I learn and the more the Holy Spirit guides me and then when I really dedicate my life to God then God opens the way for me that he helped us help me to start this uh, mission organization Global Fire Missions Ministries and then people offer offering and then we can help different places to have this live broadcast of the teaching and I thank God for that and he gives us give me so many ideas I want to keep writing this and teaching this so to help different people okay and then passage Psalm 37 4 delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart so I'm using different passages to motivate people to pray to love God and then to pray so here, delight yourself in the Lord, and shall give you, He shall give you the desires of your heart. Praying includes appreciating God and delighting in God because of His goodness, that we like Him. God is wonderful. I hope we all learn to like God. I like God because everything He does is wonderful. The things He created is wonderful. The food He created is wonderful. The work of the Holy Spirit in our heart is wonderful. Jesus' death and rest and resurrection and His spiritual life is wonderful. Heaven is wonderful. The work of the Holy Spirit to guide us, follow Him is wonderful. So I really like God. Everything He does is wonderful. Whenever we pray to Him, we experience peace and joy and love. And that's wonderful. So I really like Him. That is what it, the Bible says, delight yourself in God. That, that we really like Him, like what He does, like God Himself. And then He will give you the desires of your heart. When we delight ourselves in God, He, he will give us what our hearts desire. And we, shall count, we should count every blessing to build up our delight in God. So we should count all the blessings of God. So in our prayer, it's very important to delight in God. And in our daily life, everything we look at, we think of God. Everything we have, all the, the water we have, the material for us to make different things, all came from God. The provision came from God. The rain, the sun, the, the earth, all this came from God. Thank you, Lord. And the work of the Holy Spirit came from God. Thank you, Lord. We like God. So I hope we all learn to like God and then we convey this uh, pleasure in God, then our people will like God more and then the whole church will be blessed and people see these Christians, they will like these Christians because these Christians are joyful, they delight in God, they have the strength of God. And a passage 58 14, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So here is this delight in the Lord and then he will cause us to ride on the heights of the earth that he cause us to go high on the earth that means our life will go higher and higher he cause us to be great people so when we delight ourselves in God he will cause us to ride on the heights of the earth that means he lifts our lives to a high level and praising God and rejoicing him are the best thing we can do so we rejoice in God we like God and then God sees that we like him he will bless us Hallelujah. Okay, and then we'll wait people to wait on God. So that we can wait on God, wait for His voice. God speak to us. Now, not many people hear the audible voice of God. 
but we all sense the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The guidance that we hear most is the guidance to repent. When we sin, we always sense this move of the Holy Spirit to guide us to repent of our sins. And when we read the Bible, or when we hear the messages, the Holy Spirit will guide us to, to obey God, to guide us to change according to God's Word, and also guide us to want to help people and bless people. John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So, all Christians hear the voice of God. First, we'll hear the voice of repentance, and then the voice to obey Him, and follow Him, and, and serve Him. All Christians can hear God's voice. He moves us to repent and follow His word. He guides us to make decisions. He stops us from making mistakes. He tells us the needs of some people, so that we'll go and bless these people. And the more we pray to Him and wait on Him, the more we can hear His voice. And His voice will guide us to His wonderful plan. Now, wait on Him is not necessarily waiting for something to happen. It's just thinking of God and we say, Lord, I delight in You. I like You. I think of You. I have pleasure in You. I adore you. I praise you. So think of God. We can listen to some praise songs. We can think of God's blessings. We can meditate on, a, on some Bible verses. And then we think about the good things of God. And then in this process, sometimes God will guide us to change our lives. So that takes patience to wait on the Lord. To wait on the Lord in a peaceful, quiet way. The more... Okay, the next page. James 4.2 You lust... So warning to people who don't pray. So this is warning now. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. So here it talks about people who don't pray. And then some people they pray because they pray with wrong motives and then they don't get what they pray for. So God wants us to bless, God wants to bless all real Christians. And many Christians have many problems in their lives because they don't pray or because they pray with wrong motives. So this is a warning of people why they don't get what they want because they don't pray and also they don't pray with the right motives they pray just for money they just want something they they want god care about all these things we don't have to pray for money all the time okay so the next point is motivate people to read the bible so i'm demonstrating how to use god's grace to motivate people to change with people to read and follow the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.13 If we are faithless, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. So God is always faithful. He keeps His promises in the Bible. God is always faithful. That makes God very beautiful because people always break the promises. But God doesn't break His promises. His promises are always trustworthy. The Bible is full of His promises. So when we read the Bible, we can find these promises and we can hold on to these promises. Like seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to us. So we hold on to this and then we seek His kingdom and His righteousness. And then God will bless us. Now we don't say, God, I have, I have seek your kingdom. Why, why didn't the money come? Don't question God that. Believe that God will bless us in the right time. When we understand and trust in God's word, we'll become secure in God and we'll have great wisdom. So we'll have more security in God and we'll have great wisdom and uh, that God will bless us when we read the Word of God more and we have more faith in God. Psalm 119, 105 Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So like this person walking, it's a light to his, her feet. We don't know our future, but God has a wonderful plan for us. If we obey Him, God will make His wonderful plan come true. We don't know the future. We don't know what will happen tomorrow, but God knows. So when we follow God, we obey God's Word, God will guide us every day. God will guide us every day how to follow Him. 
it will teach us the way. Two, we don't have to worry about our future when we follow God's word. We don't have to worry about the future because God will do great things. He will guide us. He will have a wonderful plan. He has a wonderful plan already for our lives. So His word is the guidance in our daily life. And then Hebrews 4.12 for the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the hearts. So the Word of God can discern what is inside us. The problems in our lives block God's blessings from us. If we let God's Word discern and change our lives, our life will go very high. Because our worry, our sins, our, uh, how we are affected by people, all these are affecting us. And the Word of God will pierce our soul and discern what is inside us. And if we obey God's Word, then it will change us. I know, uh, you know I, I'm sure that many of us will hear some words of God or read uh, the Word of God and suddenly, oh, this passage speaks to me. So that's the Holy Spirit telling us this Bible verse applies to you. And we follow that, then we can be changed by God. So the, the Word of God is, can discern the problem in our lives and then help us. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly, equipped for every good work. So the scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So we develop doctrines. It's, it's very sad to see many people teach doctrines that are not from the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach many of these teachings. And they would teach this as if this were the Word of God but actually it's not from the Bible. So we want to teach from the Bible, not just any teaching other people are teaching. For instance, I use an illustration. Some people always talk about the attack of uh, Satan. And it causes many people to fear. And they say, if you serve God, Satan will attack you. When you, when you uh, drive out demons, Satan will attack you. And some people have great fear because of this. This is not scriptural. When we obey God, God, can, uh, God will protect us. Satan cannot attack us. At the, Satan attacks us when we sin. So we should say, my sin caused my life to be open to the attack of Satan. It's the sin, so people should repent. But many people, instead of repenting, they, they will say, oh, is it because I do ministry, because I drive out demons, uh, because I go on the mission trip, and therefore Satan can attack me? So some people, they, they're always afraid of attacks daily. They say, oh, today I feel sick. Oh, it's the attack of Satan. Uh, we don't have to worry about that because God pro protects us when we obey Him. So the key is loving God, having a close relationship with Him, and obey Him, and serve Him, and then He will protect us. So the teaching should be on God's protection instead of on Satan's attack. Now, Satan does attack when we sin. So the way to prevent Satan's attack is to obey God and follow God. Okay, and uh, God is the best teacher. God will speak through His Word. When, he read, when we read His Word, He will guide us into the best path. Okay, now uh, let me finish here. For doctrine, for reproof, for pointing out our sins, for correction, to correct us to go uh, how to change. And then instruction of righteousness, how to follow righteousness, how to obey God. And many people experience specific guidance when they read the Bible. As sometimes people receive specific guidance uh, that they should do this. For instance, they, are, uh, they have been angry with someone and then the Bible teach, uh, guide them to, re to forgive and to care for these people and bless them. Okay, motivate people to live a holy life. Galatians 6, 8 For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap destruction. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. 
So we'll, if we sow to the flesh, so the sinful nature will reap destruction. If we sow to the spirit, then we'll reap everlasting life. God gives us the Holy Spirit and wants to give us everlasting life. But when we sow to the flesh, the sinful nature will, will reap destruction in our lives. If people sow to the flesh, what they do will not count in the kingdom of God. So when we reap to the flesh, follow the flesh, follow the sinful nature, then we'll reap destruction and then it will, the life will be destroyed. But when we follow a holy life of God, when we let the Holy Spirit guide us, and then we'll have eternal life and have blessings all the way. So it's uh, very important to see that following sinful ways are very destructive and following a sinful nature is very destructive. 2 Timothy 2.20 But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So in a house there are precious vessels of gold and silver, and also wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. And then if we cleanse ourselves from sins, then we'll be a vessel of honor, useful for, for the Lord, uh, prepared for every good work. So God wants to make us vessels for honor. If we live a holy life, He will make us vessel for honor. Sins brings dishonor to our lives. So if we live a holy life, then we become a honorable vessel and then a whole life will be uh, a blessed life that we can bless more and more people. Now if you follow these teachings faithfully that you live in the love of God and you obey God and you trust in God, you know that following God is the best way and God will take care of different things, then you live a peaceful life and a joyful life and then God will bless your life more and more. I hope you believe that. that that can come to you. Proverbs 18.12 Before destruction the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. And Matthew 18.4 Therefore whoever humbles himself as his little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So when we are proud, then there is destruction. And then if we are humble, then there is honor. And then if we humble ourselves like a little child, we'll be the greatest in the kingdom of God. So here is the uh, holiness of humility. When we are humble in front of God, Lord, I need you to teach me. I need, need you to change me. I need you to guide me to have a humble heart to learn. Jesus is humble to come to die for us. All, we are, all who are humans, all who are humble like Jesus are treasured by God. So Jesus himself is very humble. So that's the nature of Jesus. His, whenever we look at any, uh, any teaching the Bible teaches us to do, Jesus has done it, except for repentance. Jesus doesn't need to repent. Uh, Jesus, everything God tells us to do, He already has done. Jesus himself is humble. He is humble himself. He is almighty God and yet he humble himself. So if we learn to be humble like Jesus, then we're treasured by God. Many sins come from pride, from humility. Many virtues come out, love, care, meekness. So when people are proud, then the sins will follow. So this is the importance that when we are humble in front of God, God will lift us high. So I always will link our holiness, whatever way we follow God. God is happy and God will bless you. God will raise your life to a higher level and use your life. Now some people always motivate people by saying God will give you money. Now that's true too. But you notice I don't talk about money that much. Although God does provide for us, I would talk about blessings of God to raise up your life to a higher level to bless people. But some people always say, I want more money, I want more money. If we trust in God, we know that God is a God uh, of blessings. He will bless us. So we don't have to always think about money. We just think about, Lord, I obey you. I follow you. You will bless us. You will open the way for me. 
Matthew 7, 21. But he who does the will of my Father uh, can inherit the kingdom of God. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So here it talks about the importance of obeying the will of God. If we don't follow God's will, even when we prophesy or cast out demons or do wonders, then we might not have uh, salvation, a living relationship with God. What Jesus talked about here is people who don't have this inner life. They don't have this inner spiritual life of God. They just do the external ministry. Then they could lose salvation. If people don't have a repentant life and a life of obedience. I have come across pastors who steal money who use money unfaithfully. When I help some pastors, and I notice that some pastors has not used the money that are destined for, and we need to repent of that. I've talked to a pastor about how he has used the money. I want accounta accountability, but he refused to give me. And I, I told him, this is very dangerous because if God looks at, you know, God always look at what we've done and then if you are stealing the money, using the money for yourself, then even though you do a lot of ministry, it's in vain. You won't have eternal life and, you know, it will take away all your, all your uh, blessings and also you can lose salvation. So it's very important that we know that we need to have a repentant life, to love God, to obey God in every way before we serve God. So God rewards people who obey Him in their spiritual life and personal life. And many serve God for money and for power and live in sins. And some could lose reward and even salvation. So when people live in sin and don't repent, they can lose salvation. Okay, so here is another motivation to take care of problems in our lives. Because uh, some people are affected by emotions, by anger, by negative thinking. Psalm 37, 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways. When they carry out their wicked schemes, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. So here it talks about be still before the Lord. Be quiet. Be peaceful. And wait patiently for Him. And don't fret. Do not be anxious for people that seed in the ways that, uh, that they, when they carry out their wicked schemes and do not have anger turn from the anger do not fret because it will lead only to evil God has planned great blessings for us no one can take away his blessings except ourselves so we trust that God is this wonderful blessing even when people try to steal us steal it from us God will protect us although we of course we want to protect what we have but sometimes people steal from us without us knowing it. And God will protect us. And God can give us back if we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So if someone is wicked, it is their problem. If I am affected by him, I will lose God's blessing. So if someone is always angry, always curse people, uh, if someone uh, uh, is not following God, is uh, doing destructive works, I don't have to be affected by them. I can protect my life, my, my uh, family, and my ministry, <clears throat> and I don't have to be angry because of them. If I'm affected by them, then I can lose my salvation, and my, uh, I mean, lose my blessings. We are affected by them, we can lose our blessings. So we want to be peaceful, we don't want to be affected by people. James 1.19, so then my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of men does not produce the righteousness of God. So uh, be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to be angry. So God blesses everyone who seek righteousness. If people get angry and hurt other people, they are not seeking God's righteousness and they will lose God's blessing. The meek shall inherit the earth. 
So when we are gentle, we inherit the earth. We inherit the earth means we have dominion over the earth. We have the authority to bless different people, different countries, different people in the world. So we want to be slow to be angry. We want to be gentle and mild. Okay, and then motivate people to serve God. Mark 9.41 For whoever gives a, you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly I tell you, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. So even if we give a cup of cold water, water to, uh, to someone because he belongs to Jesus. So first it's doing to Christians or doing to non-Christians to bring them to Jesus or doing to non-Christians to glorify God. God wants us to serve Him and bless other people. He notices every little thing we do for Him. He will reward us richly, every little thing we do for Him. If God will reward for a cup of water, He will reward much more when we devote our lives to serving Him and blessing others. So when we help people, bless other people, help their spiritual life, God is very happy to reward our whole life. If God will reward for a cup of water, He will reward much more when we build up people's spiritual life when we are full of the love of God. So all this teaching, I hope you will be uh, motivated to live in the love of God and have a joyful heart to serve God. You know, for me, I don't have to do these teachings, but I do this teaching out of love and out of my free will. I don't earn anything. I don't gain any money. And I do it all for free. And I'm happy to do that because God is happy when I serve God and I'm happy to bless other people. So I hope you, you all are willing to bless other people and that God will bless you. And God has opened my ministry wider and wider that I can bless more people. That's God's way of working. Matthew eleven twenty eight. <clears throat> Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So here, Matthew eleven twenty eight talk about first coming to Jesus. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So that's the first kind of rest when we believe in Jesus, Jesus or have a close relationship with Jesus or pray to Jesus. And then the next step is to take Jesus' yoke. That means... The yoke is what is put on the shoulder of an, of an ox to carry the weight, carry the plow. So take Jesus' yoke means that you serve with me, serve God with me. And learn from me, and learn from his life, learn from his joy, his freedom, his love. For I am gentle and lowly. Jesus is very gentle and humble. And you will find rest for your soul. So here, here this passage talks about rest two times. First in verse 28, first in verse 28 that it talks about rest here. And then here it's talked about second level of rest. Find rest for your soul when we take Jesus' yoke and learn from Jesus. So here it talks about when we are willing to serve God and learn from Jesus' life, then we'll find rest for the soul. Then we'll have more rest, a deeper rest for the soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now some people say, no, it's not easy to serve God. Now if we carry the burden, then it's hard. But if we say, God is responsible for the result, I just have a close relationship with God. You know, ministry is very important that we have a close relationship with God. Ministry is not shouting. It's not forcing people to change. But to trust in God. God is so wonderful. I enjoy God. I, I love God, I like God, I'm blessed by God, and you can be blessed by Him too. And your life can be changed and God is pleased with you. So then when we have the close relationship with God, then our, our, our burden is light. Ministry is easy then. It's not difficult. So when we come to Jesus, we'll find the first level of peace. But when we take His yoke, serve with Him, and learn from Him, we will find rest that will go deeper into our souls. And Jesus' yoke is easy because when we stay close to Him, He will help us all the way. So I hope that we all are serving God in a joyful, peaceful, burdenless way, way that we don't have burdens. Matthew 9, 9 37 to 38. 
Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of harvest, of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So the laborers are few. The harvest is plentiful. There are many people that need to be uh, brought to Christ and the life, spiritual life need to be changed. And, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray for the Lord to the Lord of Harvest to send out laborers. So we want to, want to send out more laborers, more people who serve God. Jesus cares about all people and want more people, sorry. He cares about all people and want more people saved. He wants to send out more laborers in the harvest. God is very pleased when people who have the heart to reap the harvest and train more workers. So if we are willing to serve God and train other people to serve God, God is very happy. God is happy with people who want to serve God. Motivate people to serve God. John 12, 26. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So here it talks about people who serve Jesus. If anyone serves Jesus, let him follow Jesus. That means close, have a close relationship with Jesus. And where Jesus is, there my servant will be also. And if anyone serves Jesus, the Father will honor. So fa the Father will honor people who serve Jesus. God is pleased with people who serve Him. God will be with them and will honor them. And these people will become great. So uh, when we serve God, will become great because God will honor us. When we serve God, we want to follow Jesus closely, to have a close relationship with Him. We will be servants like Jesus too to serve others. So uh, here are three points. First point is, when we serve God, God will honor us, we'll become great. The second point is, when we serve God, we want to have a close relationship with Him, then He can change us. And then we'll be my servant, so we are serving like Jesus. Jesus serves us and we want to serve other people. Now here is warning, Matthew 25, 30. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you person, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. So here are the unprofitable servant. Uh, he was cast into the outer darkness where there is whipping and gnashing of teeth. So this is a servant who has buried the talent. And then the ones on the left are the ones who did not do to the little ones of Jesus, the brothers of Jesus. You curse it into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That they will go into the fire when people don't serve God. So serving God is is a necessary fruit. Now it doesn't mean everyone has to serve God uh, in a, uh, in a uh, you know, having a position of service in the church. That he doesn't have to be like a preacher or, or evangelist in a church. Not necessarily that. But we serve God in every area of our life. We glorify God. We bring people to Jesus. We tell people about Jesus. We witness to Jesus. All these are serving God. So we want to serve God in different ways. And when people bury their talents and don't use the talents at all, then their faith has problems. We are saved by grace through faith. And the faith has problems and then they uh, may not be saved. And then people who don't do good to the Jesus brothers, then they, uh, Jesus was hungry. The little ones were hungry and he did not give them food. And then they went into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So when we don't serve God at all and, and don't bless people, that we can face uh, everlasting fire. So anything we do to glorify God and bless people, in Jesus' name is serving God. Anything we glorify God. And those who don't serve can go into hell. And we are saved by grace through faith. Faith always bears fruits. So anything we do to glorify God and bless people is serving God. So anytime we glorify God and help people, that is serving God. 
and those who don't serve can go into hell. And uh, so when people don't serve at all, they, that means their spiritual life has problem. And we are saved by grace through faith, and faith always bears fruit. We are not saved by serving God, but when we are saved by grace through faith, we will always bear fruit to serve God.